Well, for those of you who don't know me and those online, I'm Lara. I am a second year health and medical sciences student majoring in public health. So if some of my slides are more skewed towards anatomy and science, I apologize. It's just where some of my strengths lie. So learning is not easy, not easy at all. And in school, I struggled beyond belief. And I never thought that I would come to university. I tried it once. I did not have the support at Bond. And I was like, you know what? School was right. Higher learning is not for me. And then put it on pause for more than 10 years. And it took a pandemic to come back when I realized that my time in the finance world wasn't serving me and I needed to find my passion. So that's brought me back to here. Fun little activity. So these are three MRI images of various brains. And I want you to see if you can find two that look the same. So these are all brains with normal pathology. So nothing to do with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. And it's just to illustrate, the brains are like muscles. We all use different areas and we all have strengths and weaknesses in different areas. And we can all help each other when we struggle. So everyone's brain is different. And that excuse of, oh, your brain is just wired differently. Well, yes. Everyone's is. And no one should say that to you when you say that you have a learning challenge because it's just a little demoralizing. Things that I tried, and I tried a lot last year. I started with what I was taught at school. I had a book for every subject. I hand wrote verbatim. And anyone who's looked at my handwriting and my beautiful ways of spelling because English is terrible language. That was hectic and it took me so long to do and I wasn't learning anything. So then I'm like, right, we like up. Let's move on to making A3 posters, A4, sorry. And that was good. Second opportunity to learn information, had them scattered around my bedroom, but it still wasn't serving me. And that's when I found Echo 360, the app. So I would sit on my desk at home and I would write my notes while watching the lectures but I was paying so much attention to writing that I wasn't learning and then I would get upset go off on a walk and listen to the lecture and whilst I was going for a walk and listening to my lectures that's when things solidified so I wasn't watching them just listening to them in the background and it worked a treat so when my little A4 posters didn't work I went on to purchasing educational posters from medical companies these were good, but mostly just a waste of my own money. Then I decided that I needed to own every single textbook, uh, textbook on anatomy, physiology, diseases. These served a purpose, but I didn't want to open them all the time and go back and forth between lectures, textbooks. So then I thought, well, my books for every subject didn't work. My handwriting's not great. Let's print off every lecture slide and handwrite on those. So I went above and beyond on my student allowance for printing and printed off everything. Also proved to not serve a purpose, especially when it came to exam times, when I had this wad of paper that I didn't want to go near because it was just too much for me to deal with. So then I moved on to a, a tried and tested A4 and upgraded it to A3 posters. These were literally all over my bedroom. Like I was some kind of insane person scribbling on my walls. This was really helpful for me because I like art. I like color. I like quick and concise information. So I had my cells on the wall and I had a little quick pointers as to what they were and what the key information that I was meant to know was, which took me to a Dexter moment where I bought scalpels to dissect animal organs at home. So <laughs> I could better learn about all this human anatomy and physiology I was being taught. And I also bought a plastic heart model to play around with because I need to play with my information. I can't just have it static in a book or written down. 
took me to the second semester where everyone was going on about how they were using GoodNote, OneNote, Word documents. And that was perfect. They were like acing their subjects. I'm like, oh, this is what I have to do. Handwriting doesn't work. So I got onto OneNote, did all my little pages, made it pretty. So it was really aesthetic. And I was typing, remembering zero. Typing does nothing for me. So then I'm like, right, let's draw. And then as you can see, like, the handwriting still looks chaos. So that didn't work either. So that brought us around to exam times again. And we're like, we've learned nothing. So then Ange was like, make flashcards. Made a bunch of flashcards. That was goal. It is old school, but for the right person, it works. And I got to play with it. It was like a game. I wrote them all up. And I had that second and third interaction with all the information again. So that was really helping. And Tiana brought this up, but voice recordings. I like the sound of my voice. So this was good for me. So I would go for walks or I'd be on campus and I'm like, oh, oh my God, this is the idea. This is what I was meant to understand. And I would record it or I would ask myself a question like, all right, what did they mean by this? Or what do I understand? What don't I understand? So I could come back to it later when I was less stressed or I had time. But this was just a really good information, a good way, sorry, to get information out quickly and on the go without having to write anything. Things that have worked and I am taking with me into this year, one notebook. And this is a really good notebook because it's also digital. So you can scan your pages into an app and you can view them across your phone, your tablet, your computer. And it's nice and organized into all your little subject groups. One folder, which only contains assignments. So I print off all the assignment rubrics, any assignment criteria and put it all in there. And I plan out on a separate document all the assignments I have for that semester. So I know when they're due and I can see it every time I open it, it's the first page. Podcasts and YouTube are awesome. Especially if you can find them in your subject field, because sometimes when you're hearing information from a lecturer, a teacher, a professor, the way in which they're presenting it to you is, is of their knowledge level. They've spent years with this subject. They're great at it, but sometimes they can't bring it down to let's start from the start. And hearing someone else present it in a really quick three to 10 minute where it's engaging, you've got a YouTube, it's fascinating, or you've got a podcast with a voice that resonates with you really helps to solidify the information. Still saying with my voice recordings and Echo 360 on the app, because it's just fantastic to walk around and listen to your lectures and not have to watch them. Things that are important to remember that we forget, and this comes from a place of privilege, but eating well, your brain needs food. Getting adequate sleep and when you need help, asking for it. I think that's the beauty we have as nearly diverse people. We've been through all of the rigors at school and being persecuted, but we know when to ask for help. And it's something that I've found when talking to other people in my degree who are not nearly diverse. They don't want to ask for help. They feel ashamed and it's holding them back. They're like, oh, please get degrees. And they're fine with that. When if they just asked for help, they could do a lot better and see them be more successful. So never be afraid to ask for help, get sleep and eat. And thank you. It's been a privilege to talk to you all. And thank you to everyone online. Gavin, did you want to stand up or did you want to sit there? I can or? stand up. Yeah. Or, uh, I'll just see people in here. So it's kind of weird. It's all right. Um, as long as you're just around here, so the mic, I pick okay. up the mic. Yeah, cool. So I don't have these two beautiful um, presentations. I don't have anything kind of like set up like this, but um, as a disorientating dyslexic, um, because which happens most of the times for me, 
Um, you kind of go off on all different kinds of tangents and all that kind of stuff. Um, I've kind of, kind of uh, want to kind of maybe not add on, but my kind of take on, on the two things. Um, so I, I came up with something, not came up with something, I've heard something recently, um, a guy uh, by the name of James Clear. I don't know if anybody's read his book, Atomic Habits. He has a beautiful saying that we do not rise to the level of our goals, but we fall to the level of our systems. So for me coming to university, I'm 38 years old now. I've, I, you know, graduated high school and I went to culinary school and I've been traveling and cooking the world um, for the last 20 years. Same kind of thing in COVID. I wasn't able to go home. I had left my job. I had given notice three months before I was going home. I was going to be around my support team and that was taken out. What am I going to do? You know what? I always wanted to study psych at uni. Okay, let's go for it. So I applied for a foundations course. Um, I was rejected uh, because I wasn't, I didn't um, fit the requirements because I had a GPA at culinary school. I could apply directly for uni. Oh my God, two weeks. And I was at uni all of a sudden after nothing. So it was kind of, it, it took me back and I had to build those systems. Um, so for me, what's been awesome is, yeah, the writing center um, kind of, I was told about it. I, I knew I had a little disability, disability support kind of helped. Um, but meeting Tiana and just kind of having that support kind of took it to another level. And as you can see, all of the different systems, as Laura was saying, you know, going through the different bits. Also, as dyslexics, you're always kind of, we have a tendency to always look for that other angle. Um, so maybe um, my stuff doesn't actually, um, like it's, it's always changing, which sometimes is a problem. I saw a beautiful poster um, downstairs. It was by the, um, uh, oh, where is it? by the medical by the doctor's office it says it's a COVID related thing but don't undo all the good so that's something that I have to know when I'm learning these things and I'm setting up my systems hey maybe I shouldn't don't need to look for another system maybe just kind of keep on this one because it's working um, so a little some of the the highlights that I've had um, of of course yes knowing that um, not everyone is different uh, or no sorry knowing that everyone is different and and you can <laughs> can actually ask for help. That was a beautiful thing in my um, uh, introduction to uni when I came in here um, at mid-year through 2020. Um, they said, of course, not, you know, you're going to look to your left and your right. Everybody's going to know different things. They're going to be specialized in different areas, even if you're doing the same course. Um, so yeah, use your, use the people around you as much as you can, kind of take as much information and also build those systems up because um, going to university isn't always about what you know, it's how you're actually learning what you're doing and so you can put it to your professional life. That's just my opinion. Um, so yes, the, um, some of the things that Tiana's really helped me with, um, yeah, Zotoro, um, the Corona method, um, but also the, the apps specifically. Um, being really lucky over the time that I've had another problem with me going to, um, well, trying to go into university when I was younger. Of course, 20 years ago, we didn't have these beautiful computers. We didn't have the apps. We didn't have the tablets and all that. So I invested in some things that have been instrumental to me. So something like Notability, where originally the reason why I got it was because I could actually write on it and it was, um, and you could change the color and the lines and all of this so you could see it. Now, in the last year, um, as you can see on, well, no, you can't, not everybody can see online, but there's, um, there's a, um, the, on the, uh, yeah, the dark mode on Microsoft Word is awesome. And then also too, so I have a friend, um, Jess, who takes all of her slides and puts them on copies and pastes them and, and you can reformat it so it's all there. So when you're going through your lecture, you just kind of like, oh, okay, I can add things, color coordinate, coordinate it and all that kind of stuff. So that was something that I just actually did yesterday. Um, so little, little gifts um, like that. Satoro as well is, it's a, it's a deal, like, it's amazing. It's another kind of like level. You just kind of, just like anything, when you look at it, it might look a little bit confusing, but actually going in there and um, finding all of your stuff, you can put, you can have your, you can have different headings. So you can say, okay, well, I'm look, working on this project and you can save it, that um, PDF and that website saved directly to what you're actually looking at. And it actually says when it was published. And then there's another thing when it was actually um, downloaded onto your computer. So you can think of like, oh, okay, well, when actually was it? For books, for me, I'm really good with that. Like I can read something in a book and I can remember the page number. But of course, with everything on digital, it's really hard to do that. So that's a kind of like, you should kind of make, make the technology work for you. Um, and I guess the, the last little thing, um, as Laura pointed out and um, 
Tiana as well, eating through the day. I've been really lucky. I work in a, a still a chef. I work three days um, and go to uni three days. Uh, so for three courses um, and then one day off, kind of, I try to. Um, but what I've been really lucky with is um, some of the girls that, um, that I work with, uh, some of the people that I work with, they've just graduated. So one's just graduated from nutrition and she didn't know what she was going to do. So I said, hey, Laura, uh, Lauren, um, make me a plan. So I'm getting a deal with her and she's setting me up. So I actually know, okay, my energy level. So this isn't just my physical energy, but also my mental energy is now kind of sustained over the day because I have a junior person who just come out of uni who knows what she's doing. So this is also, yeah, using your friends and family around it. So it's not necessarily what you're eating, but how you're actually eating it. So I've never had custard. I didn't, I don't like custard, but like custard and banana and some walnuts, like in, uh, at two or three o'clock in the morning. It goes, or not two o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> in the afternoon, kind of like boosts you up and you have that sugar rush and it's not something, you know, it's low in fat. It's just good for you on a number of different reasons. So there are, yeah, other ways to kind of work around um, the busy schedule of uni life. Um, so yeah, all coming around and coming to it. And I guess that's, yeah. And I guess also to understand, just kind of in closing, um, I read a book and I did a, uh, some stuff when I was younger. Because I've been diagnosed, I was diagnosed at ten years old. There's a book called The Gift of Dyslexic Dyslexia by Ronald D. Davis, and to understand that yes, we are all different, but it's actually a strength. Um, and we, if we learn how to now coming in to, I, I don't know if people understand CBT, which is uh, cognitive behavior therapy. There's uh, the third level of CBT is something called ACT, which is acceptance and commitment therapy, where you get to. So learning psychology, I'm interested in this field going forward with that. Um, and it's all about accepting what you have. And, and it's when you can have a team around you that reinforces and can accept you for who you are and um, what you're doing. And with dyslexia, it's you know having all of those years of, of hard trouble. It's the, the reason why I can get distinctions and I can do well and excel at university. So thank you, Tiana. And thanks, everybody. <laughs> okay. So... I think, what time is it? 11.15, okay. So I think, um, what would everyone like to do? So we'll talk to both online and here. Do we wanna maybe do like Q and A, just questions and talk, or do we want to study? Like, what would we like to do? So I'm just keeping my eye on a chat box in this. Um, I'm happy to do Q and A and a bit of discussion. I think we've got a lot to learn yeah. from each other. Hang on. Say that again for me, Shona. Um, um I'm happy to do Q&A um, and discussion if that's cool. okay with everyone, yeah. Yeah, so anybody else in the room want to do Q&A and discussion? Yep, 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 cool. So what I reckon we're going to have to do, um, Michael's going to have to run around with the laptop because it's got the mic. So he's going to have to do um, some exercise this morning. Oh, no. So what's the, does anyone have any questions about any, I'll go back to the slides. So we can make sure that they're there. Does anyone have any questions from my presentation first? Um, I have one for you, Tiana. Um, do, do you find that your diagnosis um, affect how you interact with other people in the institution and how you get along with colleagues or how they understand you? Um, definitely. I think like I'm super, super lucky in that I'm in a really like I work with other learning advisors such as Michael and I'm actually um, something that a lot of people don't know about our team is that the majority of us are actually neurodiverse it, as learning advisors. So I think we've got two or three um, learning advisors who have ADHD and then I'm dyslexic and I'm currently in the middle of trying to get an ADHD diagnosis as well. So I'm, I'm super lucky in that I've got that support network there and my colleagues are really good, but I have been in other areas. Um, for example, my, as Shona knows, and some of you may know, I come from classics and ancient history, which is, um, quite unforgiving <laughs> when it comes to um, dyslexia and you know a problem with dyslexia is not pronouncing things correctly so I remember one moment that kind of um, took with me and I'm not going to name names or do anything like that because that's not professional and that's not collegial but 
it did really affect me. It really hurt me because it was something that I sort of grew up dealing with. Um, so my master's thesis was all about um, papyri. And I could ne I still struggle trying to say that word. It's a really difficult word for my brain to actually say for some reason. So papyrus, papyri, papyri, like I just, oh my God, like just it gives me anxiety now just having to like restate it, even though it's in my thesis title and everything. And I was giving a, I was giving a presentation um, about my, a, a recent book chapter that I had written, which was all about um, the PGM, which is the Greek magical papyri. And I had mispronounced that word several times and some of my colleagues were sniggering about it and that wasn't very and I found out later because my supervisor said to me in the nicest way possible look like I just want to let you know that this is actually how you pronounce the word because you know other people were talking at this particular presentation slash conference that you didn't even know how to pronounce the word correctly so it still happens there's still a lot of um you know problems with I think accepting that dyslexia looks different and is different to a lot of different people and me and my mum um I think because you know dyslexic is genetic we know that and so is ADHD I found out that you are, um, if one of your parents has ADHD or possibly an undiagnosed ADHD, they are 92% more likely to um, pass it on to their child. So it's huge, right? And same with dyslexia. So I think my dad, my dad is definitely dyslexic um, and my mum likely has the undiagnosed ADHD. And what we both struggle with at the end of the day is like getting the words out. And it's, it's a really, it's a really big struggle. So like some people will just sort of think, well, what's wrong with you? Are, you? are you stupid? Are you slow? Like you can't like, you know, talk. And so I've had that in workplaces before. The worst thing I think is um, sometimes patrons, well, I call them patrons because I work at the festival center. So they're not customers, they're patrons. And I have regularly gotten people's seats mixed up because of the numbers. So the numbers have switched. <laughs> And because they don't want to look for themselves, because nobody wants to do anything for themselves anymore, they'll go to that area that I said, like, especially ones and twos. I don't know about the rest of you, but sometimes I see 12 and it goes to 21. Mm -hmm. So I'll be like, go to row D, seat 21. And they go to seat 21 and then they come storming back up and they're like, somebody's in my seat. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, calm down. And then I realize, oh crap, I've, I've done it again. <laughs> So it's just, yeah, you just deal with it. Does that sort of answer your um, question, Shona? I know that I was, it was a very roundabout way. Yeah, go, cool, I can see you. So does anyone else have any questions? Michael's gonna come running to you. So I kind of have a, an issue which is somewhat in the same domain, but kind of opposite in that, like, since I'm autistic, I very, very, like, there kind of becomes an element in my study where I overstudy. Like sometimes I'll read and I'll be like, oh, it's been six hours. <laughs> yeah, and like, it's very, very annoying because then when that happens, I really want to talk about the thing that I want to talk about, but then it's like, I've only got a thousand words to do it. So I just kind of find that I always have trouble with like overstudying and bit like overreaching me like, oh, all, all of these cool like concepts I want to like, talk about like fascism and like discuss how like that affects like this but like you know I might be talking about fascism and then I'll move into like something completely different because <laughs> I've like made some weird connections. Right? It's like I want to talk about fascism. Sorry, yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> so we have courses called like genocide. Just yeah yeah so, sorry yeah I'm, 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 I kind of do genocide studies and fascism studies. Yeah I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying I want to do a fascism or anything I'm just saying it's an interesting thing to study. <laughs> Get my steps so, out. I think, yeah, I think what you might be going through is like a hyper focus, right? Like people who are autistic and have ADHD and dyslexia as well, they hyper focus. Um, and you, yeah, you get sort of caught up in that like six or seven hour sort of like reading session or like rabbit hole of, you know, reading where you go from like one thing to another to another because it's exciting you and you're like, oh my God, this is so cool. And then you just keep going. I do that all the time. Um, yes yeah 
<laughs> yeah, ex yeah, exactly. So um, for those who couldn't hear online, that was just um, talking about how, you know, you go to bibliographies and then you're like going down the JSTOR rabbit hole. Um, that, the best strategy I found for that is again, sort of setting myself that goal of like, this is how many words I have. So if you have a 1400 word essay and you think, okay, so what's the percentage? What's the breakdown of this, right? I've got maybe 120, 150 words for an introduction. Then I've got another 120 and 150 words for conclusion. So minus all of that, how much can I actually dedicate each paragraph? And what's the question actually asking me to do? Because the thing about hyper-focus with study, so when you're going down the research rabbit hole, is my view is that it's actually procrastination because you don't want to get to the writing. You just want to do the research part because the research part is so much fun than the writing. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's still work. Like you're in, and that's why you don't really feel that sense of urgency because you're still actually working. You're still doing something that's productive. But what it is, it's procrastinating from the writing, you know, like from the writing task. And so what I do with that is that the best way that you can make sure you don't go down this rabbit hole and keep trying to like incorporate more and more and more is again, just go, this is what the question wants me to do. This is what I have to do. I'm going to have an off, I call it, it's a really bad term. I call it an orphan document where any of the stuff that I think might fit into something down the line or ideas I might have because you sound like a great PhD student because a PhD student can go to do something like that. You have 80,000 words to write and still won't have enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, what you do is you take all of the stuff that you have written that you've cut and you put it in that in a document that sits on its own and you call it whatever you want to call it, extra thoughts, additional things, orphan document, whatever and it just stands on its own and then you can pick and choose out of those things and make sure that it fits what the essay is trying to do because as someone who um, is now a tutor and a, a, I'm a marker and I teach at two universities at Macquarie University and I've taught here and here in the past is that I found that lots of students didn't actually address the question and that's the main thing is that they don't answer the question and that's what loses you marks is you could have written something absolutely phenomenal that I think wow this is really cool but I'm really sorry I have to pass you because you didn't actually address the question so it's again just sort of like writing it down and remembering it and having that written maybe somewhere on a, on a reminder or something like just do this task you don't have to do anything else and that's a habit thing that's something that needs to become habitual it's not something that there's like a quick fix for you just have to do it unfortunately so yeah any other questions so far mm -hmm. let me have a quick look i think jay marie said i do the same thing but it's to do with anxiety i have to know everything otherwise i'll get something wrong um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, super relatable for me. I always feel like I need to know, I need to know absolutely everything. But again, at the end of the day, you can't read everything. You just can't because there's so much research out there now. Like it's just phenomenal, especially if you're in health sciences or you're in sciences in general, the amount of research that gets published on a week to week basis. So if you, if you go on Adelaide Library Database right now and you just look at something that's like cancer research and look at how many articles has been published within two years, you're looking at like at least over 100,000. Right, because the, the thing about academia now that a lot of people and a lot of students don't is that it's pub it's publish or perish right so you need to be constantly publishing um and that means that you've just got a lot of work out there and we then go to the students here read this but that doesn't actually work because again that knowledge isn't produced for you it's produced for very very small sets of people to give you an example about knowledge production because i think that this is i know i keep harking back to this but it's really really important my master's thesis was on something so very specific that only three people on this earth could mark it. Three people. It was about um, the reception of the idea of this um, henotheistic one god from Egypt, Amun, in, the, in Greek philosophy and in the Greek magical papyri. So weird. 
nobody could like, mark that, right? And like, so they ended up having to find people that were super, super broad just to get them to mark it because the one person that could mark it was dead. So, yeah, again, <laughs> knowledge production and the way not that knowledge is produced is really important for you to know, especially like as Susie is finding out, as lots of people are finding out with honours level, it's, it can become quite difficult to do. So, yeah. With the reading too much, you can comment on this as a teacher as well. Yeah. What I'm expecting is to know things like one of the set of plan, right? But you have a thousand words or 1500 or 2000. Oh, yeah. golly, you're not going to include everything here as well. If you think of it instead of a the answer, the best answer, the slam dunk mic argument. Yeah. And instead go a well reasoned argument with engagement with some key research. Yeah. And I, I think it's a stop, right? But yeah. some. That's, What's, the, that's what we're studying, right? Like, yeah. That's the words. Do you read it? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. What's I think the amazing thing is that, again, this was explained to me um, when I was in honours about what the expectation levels of students for like each stage. Just say you have someone who goes from first year undergrad to, to finish PhD. Let's say they do a master's in between, right? Like I'm doing. In the bachelor's, for, if you have an essay, you are expected to answer the question. That is it. Just answer the question to the best of your ability with the sources you are able to find and in the time frame we're allowing you answer the question. When you get to honours, they're trying to understand if you can actually do research, right? If you can create a question and then apply that, you know, question to other bodies of knowledge and getting you to sort of just dip your toes in the water of research, right? If you do a master's by research and you go on and do master's level, they're not expecting you to prove anything new. They just, again, want you to maybe look at something from another angle, apply a research framework or methodology and show that you can actually do it. It's when you get to PhD level that they want you to find something new. They want you to prove that not only can you do the research, answer the question, set it out and write a whole book on it, but that you've actually addressed something that nobody else has addressed before. You filled the gap in our scholarly knowledge. That's the process. And I think a lot of students, again, think that at undergrad, we're expecting them to know everything. We're expecting them to produce these like amazing bodies of knowledge, but that's not what we want from you. We just want you to answer the question.